This is Pastor Jason Bratcher, and welcome to Hartford Baptist Church. We're glad that you've decided to join us today in our time of worship unto Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, through singing of praise, sharing our tithes and our offerings, and the reading and preaching of the God-breathed Word of God. We invite you to come to our facility at 415 Liberty Street, Hartford, Kentucky, next to the Community Center. Our traditional service starts at 9 a.m., Bust Academy, Sunday School, at 10.15 a.m., and our contemporary service starts at 11.15 a.m. The Kingdom Kids Ministry, or Children's Church, as well as our nursery is provided in our 11.15 a.m. service. The registration table for those ministries is in our education wing and begins at 11 a.m. At Hartford Baptist Church, we're a community of grace, serving a community of needs. May God bless you through the services here today. Good morning. Welcome to Hartford Baptist Church. Welcome home. Let's just have a morning of, of worship. Okay, let's just, let's just worship our amazing, our awesome God. Will you stand as we sing to him? When he rolled up his sleeves, he ain't putting on the red. Footsteps and lightning in his fist. Oh, Our God, God is an awesome, awesome God. God. And the Lord wasn't choking when he kicked him out of the. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close. You better be believing. Oh, God, God is an awesome God. God. Oh, Our God, God is an awesome God. God. Night. Lord God, God is an awesome God. God. He spoke into the darkness, created the light. Lord God, God is an awesome God. God. In judgment and wrath, He poured out on Sodom. Mercy and grace, He gave us at the cross. Hope that we have not too quickly forgotten. Lord God is an awesome God. Lord Father, you are an awesome God, and to you we praise this morning, Lord. Um, we come to you just uh, bearing, bearing our hearts, bearing our souls, and, and, um, and Father, we come giving you our, our tithes, our offerings, and Lord, that you may take this and, and, um, and that it may be used in the right way for the building up of your kingdom, Lord. And, and now I just, I just pray that, um, that you would fall upon us, Lord, and that we would open up our hearts to you completely this morning. In your name I pray. Amen.
Thank you, Miss Bard. Can we give the Lord a hand clap of praise this morning? Amen? Amen. Yeah, I'll give him a praise in the house this morning. I'll tell you what, <clears throat> sorry girls, I'm going to have to be left-handed today. All right? You're over here all by yourself. i tell you what, if you'll move over, I will. How about that? How about that? There we go. We don't even need that. There we go. I'll just come right over. Hey, I'll, there you go. Hey, say, Jeff. Jeff's waving. This morning, I want to talk about being spirit-led. Uh, Galatians chapter 6, verses 1 through 10. That's where we're going to be if you've got your Bibles and you want to turn there with us this morning. But we've got to be a spirit-led people. Spirit-led people. If you would, stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word this morning. Brothers and sisters, if someone is taken in any wrongdoing, you who are spiritual restore such a person with a gentle spirit, watching out for yourselves so that you also won't be tempted. Carry one another's burdens in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. For if anyone considers himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. Say he deceives himself with me, would you? He deceives himself. 
Let each person examine his own work and then he can take pride in himself alone and not compare himself with someone else. For each person will have to carry his own load. Say that with me. For each person will have to carry his own load. Verse 6. Let the one who is taught the word share all his good things with the teacher. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever a person sows, he will also reap. Because the one who sows to his flesh will reap destruction from the flesh. But the one who sows to the Spirit will reap eternal life from the Spirit. Let us not get tired of doing good, for we will reap at the proper time if we don't give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us all let us work for the good of all, especially for those who belong to the household of faith. Would you pray with me for just a moment? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we read your word this morning, I pray this, that it, your Holy Spirit begins to use it to penetrate our very hearts. Lord, I pray not only as individuals, but corporately this morning, Lord, your spirit would begin to penetrate our hearts to be that which you have called us to be, to do those things you have called us to do, but Lord, to do them out of love, out of the desire of your heart, and not out of the necessity that we must do them. Lord, I pray this morning your spirit and your word would not return back to you as void. It's in your precious name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, Paul is talking about this right after a pretty important passage that he's written there in 5. But he doesn't go on about signs. He doesn't go on about the awesome wonders of God. He doesn't go into detail because we just see in, in 5 he talks about the spiritual gifts. He doesn't go into talking in detail about those spiritual gifts. But what he does talk about is how the community of faith operates when the Spirit is leading. He's not talking about when the flesh is leading and when we're doing things that people recognize and we're doing things that make us feel good. He's talking about when the Spirit of God is leading us to do those things. Life in the Spirit involves a healthy relationship within the body of Christ. Now what it doesn't involve is conceit. What it doesn't involve is envy. But complete life of love. A complete life of love. You see that life, as I just said, in the spirit involves healthy relationships in the body of Christ. Now, we, we want to talk about getting everybody in the world saved. And that needs to be our goal as Christians. But let me tell you what. If you look around this morning, I guarantee you there is hurting in the brothers and sisters in Christ somewhere in this house this morning. If not everywhere, we've all got a little bit of hurt. We need to be there for one another. And we have to do that. And I want to talk about that because you see, as I was reading the commentary this week, preparing for this message, the uh, Christ-centered commentary, uh, David Platt was the... Uh, author of this this particular session but uh, he was writing he wrote this story it was about a woman that was in this congregation and and she went up to her pastor and she says because the pastor evidently been preaching about we need to be more active we need to be getting more people to come to church and, and she comes to him and says well we need more signs and we need more wonders we need God to really act out to get people's attention so that people will come and people will be excited about being here basically is what she was telling her and the pastor looks at her and says let me tell you something and he points over here and there's a lady there with her children she said he said this lady and her children have just been evicted from their home it would be an awesome sign and wonder of God to me if you take them home with you for about three or four months till they get back on their feet you see we get so wrapped up in waiting on God to do this waiting on God to do that let me tell you what we have the spirit of God in us and we are to show that when we're called Christians Christian means Christ-like we are to be that 
Now, if that lady was there on that pew, I'm going to assume she was a Christian and nobody there was reaching out to her. We need to reach out to our brothers and sisters in Christ because let me tell you, we're a lot like that lady, aren't we? We're waiting for a sign. We're waiting for some awesome something to happen. We're wanting 20 baptisms every Sunday. That would be God's in it. Let me tell you when God's in it, it's when his people are in it. We're wanting, yeah, give him praise. We, we were always looking for God to do something miraculous. We're looking, we are God's representatives here to the lost and to one another. We need to be the ones that are acting out. You know, there, I want to give you something that might surprise you. I don't know if it will or not. Many Christians talk about the Spirit's works in their life and how the Spirit moves in their life, but they don't even belong to a church. There's a revival going on over here, so they're going to go to it because they hear it's going great. And they're going over here that they just had an awesome move of God over here and, and 30 people got saved and got back. Well, I'm going to pick up and I'm going to go over there for a while. But they never belonged to anything, but they talk about the Spirit of God moving in them. But they're here, they're there. What some people want to call them church hoppers. And they're here and they're there, but they never belong to anything. Let me tell you, they are not a New Testament Christian. I'm not saying they're not Christian, but they're not the New Testament Christian. You know, they, they listen to sermons online. They listen to, they watch the church on Sunday at home on the TV set. And there's nothing wrong with getting a word from wherever you can get a word. But let me tell you what, God calls us to be a part of a community of believers. He calls us to be a part, an active part of a community of believers. Because let me tell you, I found this uh, phrase this week. I hadn't really heard of it, and I got to reading up on it, and, and it's a pretty common phrase, that we live in a society today, and we've been called, we've been named something. We've been called the crowded loneliness. The crowded loneliness. Because we are all in big groups, but nobody knows anybody. I got a brother... I love him to death. He lives in New York, and he lives in an apartment, and he don't want to know any of his, uh, his uh, neighbors. He didn't want to know any of them. As a matter of fact, he used to live in Boston. Anybody ever heard of the Craigslist uh, murderer? He was his next-door neighbor, and he didn't even know him. He come in, the police was there arresting him. He just the day before called and had him reported because he was making so much noise over it, probably killing somebody. He didn't even know who he was. We live in a society like that. I'm not down on my brother for that. I'm just saying. We live in a society like that today. We are in crowded loneliness. Let me, let me give you a challenge today. We need to change that. We need to break that chain of that. And we need to become a biblical community. Let's change it from crowded loneliness to biblical community. I'm not talking about we all need to walk around carrying staffs and towels on our heads. We need to become Christ-like communities, leaning on one another, helping one another, encouraging one another. And how do we do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. First of all, we've got to have some restoration. There's got to be restoration because there's a need for it. Paul says there, uh, in the family, we get caught in some wrongdoings. Anybody, don't raise your hand. Just, I want you to think about it. You ever been caught in some wrongdoing? I told you not to raise your hands, but I'm going to raise mine because I have. I've been caught in some wrongdoings. Because let me tell you, the enemy sets traps for you. I don't know if you understand that or not. He sets traps waiting and laying for you to get snared into those traps. You know, I made the analogy this morning. When I was a, a little, little guy, my dad and myself, we built... Rabbit, wooden rabbit traps. And there was a field over in front of the house in front of me, and I loved to try to trap those rabbits. Sometimes I was lucky at it, sometimes I wasn't. But every now and then, I get lucky. And you know what was awesome about those traps? I finally figured out, just a little guy, this is going to sound stupid, I finally figured out what to use for bait. That, that was the key to the trap. The trap would work if the bait was right. Now, I, I made this, and everybody laughed at me this morning. I used uh, garlic. And they didn't like that. They wouldn't come to that. But I could take carrots 
and smash them up and make them paste out of them and put them in the back of that trap. And every time I go to that trap, there was something in it. Why? Because that enticed that rabbit to get in there. And then it was trapped. It had no way out. But now, the thing about me trapping rabbits is I didn't really want to kill the rabbits. I just like trapping them. I'd let them go. So they were trapped there until I let it go. Till I raised the lid. And let me tell you what, I made this analogy this morning. I never had a rabbit come to the edge of the box, look around, say, it's a lot nicer in here, and went right back. It always ran out. Some of them would come out and be uh, such a tears. They'd eat my feet alive, me trying to get away from them. But they were always that ready to get out of there. They didn't want to stay in there anymore. Let me tell you what, we've got an enemy that sets traps. And let me tell you what, that there may be some of you in here that like garlic. There may be some of you in here that likes the carrots all smashed up. Maybe you're the one that likes the lettuce, but let me tell you what, Satan, you remember a few weeks ago I told you Satan's done his homework. He knows what entices you, and he knows what entices me, and he puts it in the back of that trap. And eventually, he's going to get your attention. If we as believers will congregate around one another, and if we will spiritually, not of our flesh, to stand between, but to spiritually nurture one another to keep from going in after the carrot. But let me tell you the, the other flip side to that. Sometimes we go in anyway and we're trapped. Somebody's got to raise the lid. Somebody's got to raise the lid. We've got to be there for one another. You know, I've got friends of mine uh, in, that are pastors and they have, and I, Jerry was here this morning, Jerry Hendricks, and he's a U, U of L fan. You know, I made fun of him about uh, Rick Patino and his indiscretions. My guys, some of my friends in the ministry have had those indiscretions. And more times than not, the trap door was never opened to let them out and to nurture them, but it was left shut and they threw the whole trap away. That's not Christian. That's not Christian. Yes, Matthew gives us uh, uh, biblical discipline, church discipline rules, and it, if you want to call it that, and in that there is places for those to be removed from position, absolutely. But we are to restore. Restore where you are, from where you are back to where God wants you to be. Now sometimes that doesn't mean all the way back to where you were. Sometimes it means past where you were, but restore you back where God wants you to be. And it's our responsibility as Christians to love them to that spot and to show them Jesus to that spot and not condemn them and throw them and the trap over the hill. Because Satan knows exactly what it takes to entice you. James chapter 5 Verses 19 and 20. It says, My brothers and sisters, if I can get it, come here it is. My brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his way will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Think about that. So with that scripture, let me, let me say this to you. Are you concerned with straying church members? Are you concerned with that? You know, I was reading in that same commentary, uh, Platt was talking about his neighbor had a, a miniature schnauzer and it come up missing. And they lived in a, pre, in a neighborhood there that evidently they all kind of knew each other. And, and, and man, all of a sudden the whole neighborhood was in an uproar looking for this miniature schnauzer. They were down the sidewalks yelling its name out. They were looking in, behind bushes. They were everywhere. They were going door to door. Have you seen this dog? Have you seen this dog? And, and he said his neighbor made this, made this thing. He says, it felt like my world was coming to an end. Now don't misunderstand what I'm getting ready to say. I've got pets. I love my pets. I do. I, there's a place for that. 
But my question is, do we have a bigger heart for wandering pets than we have for wandering brothers and sisters in Christ? I say that because uh, a couple days ago I was just driving around. I had to waste some time and I was driving around checking things out. And you know what I did not see in any of the neighborhoods? Anybody walking down the sidewalk yelling out, is there anybody lost that needs Jesus? And I'm going to pick on Rebecca and Jeremy just a minute because I know if Daisy was missing, they'd be walking down the sidewalk saying, Daisy, Daisy, Daisy. Huh? Dixie, 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 Daisy, dog. I know they would. You know, I didn't see anybody in those neighborhoods knocking on the door because they were worried about them not knowing Jesus. Do we wonder, worry more about wandering pets than we do about wandering brothers and sisters in Christ? Or do we have this kind of attitude? Well, it's really none of my business. It's, it's your business because you're, you know them. It's not my business. It's your business. Let me tell you something. I've got two brothers, two sister-in-laws, two nephews, two sons, two daughter-in-laws getting ready to be, by the way, if you hadn't heard. I got my second one started last night. She's now going to be a bratcher. Uh, I got all these. Let me tell you, I'm responsible for them. They're responsible for me. I'm responsible for you, and you are responsible for me in Christ. Look at the person on your right. You're responsible to them. Look at the person on your left. You're responsible for them in Christ. In Christ. Not just on Sunday mornings, not just on Wednesday night at prayer meeting. We have got to have the spirit of faith for our brothers and sisters in Christ. You know, the bo- when the body suffers, the body suffers when it's bro- something's broken, right? The worst thing for me is a stump toe. I hate getting up in the middle of the night and stumping my toe because when that toe hurts, I swear it feels like even my nostrils are throbbing, okay? When one is messed up, everything's messed up. When there's one hurting in the church, we all should be hurting we should all be hurting. Now let me, let me just make this statement. The church isn't the Red Cross. The church isn't the Rotary Club. Now those are both great organizations. They do a lot of great things. The church is a, something very different. We are brothers and sisters adopted into God's family, knit together in a holy spirit of fellowship. It's different. That's different. I belong to fraternities. I belong to uh, groups. And we, I've had some great friends in that. But let me tell you, we weren't hooked together by the Spirit of God. We were hooked together by the Spirit, a spirit of the flesh. And I wonder sometimes, are we not more connected to them than we are to God? We're not more connected to those organizations than we are to the family of God. We've got to seek the spiritual welfare of one another. Well, so what are we going to do? What are we supposed to do then? If this is true, then what are we supposed to do? Paul says, restore such a person. Now, I want to define that word restore for just a minute. The way, that word, the way it's used in the, in the scriptures is to put back together or to repair. So it's the same word that you would find in that day to, for a broken bone. Now, a broken uh, leg, once it's broken, it's not much use, right? What, ha- what has to happen for that leg to be useful when that bone's broke? That means this leg's got to work twice as hard. You've got to get your balance just right, and you've got to learn to, everything else has got to what? Make up the difference. Make up the difference until what? until it heals. Then when it heals, even though it's healed, it's still got to get stronger. And it's still got to get stronger. 
and eventually it's back to where it was. And maybe working on it, it gets a little stronger than it was to start with. Let me tell you, it's what it is like being a child of God. When something happens in your life and you get a little bit broken, we, the church, needs to step up and pick up the slack for a little while while the healing process is going on. And once that healing happens, we need to continue to work with you to restore you back where you were or maybe even through your trials and tribulations, God moves you just a little bit farther. But it takes brothers and sisters in Christ. We're not the healers. We're not the saviors. What we are, we're the in-betweens. We're to show you Jesus. We're to show you what he can do. We're to be that testimony for him. So the goal for us, the church, is to put broken things back together. Marriages back together. Lives back together. Putting the broken bones of life back together. Now, I want us to be careful and in doing all this, and we're watching this person, and we're watching that person. The pastor says, I need to pay attention to them because they may need some help in their life. But let me tell you what you're not. We are not the righteousness police. We're not the righteousness police. We're not inspecting every detail of a person's life. The things talked about here are the sins that are destroying people, not just uh, issues. Here, here, let me give you some examples. Do you know a brother or sister that is addicted to a substance? You know somebody who's a workaholic and ignoring their family? How about a shady relationship that your friend may be having, but if he knew his, his wife knew that, it wouldn't go over very well. Even though there's nothing shady going on, but just the looks of it. Be a person who cares for your brother and sister, not just everybody's accountability partner. You know, I made this uh, assertion this morning. I've got about five or six guys every day that I make contact with for accountability. Either them for me or me for them, either way. What I have to be careful for is that I am not their savior and they're not my savior. I, I can't make them account because they know what I'm going to ask them when I talk to them. What would you do last night? What you done this morning? They're going to tell me because they're going to ask me the same thing and I'm going to tell them. And sometimes I don't want them to know what I did last night or what I did this morning or what I did not do this morning or what I did not do last night. And we've got to be careful that we're not just accountability partners, but we are restorers. When they tell you I did this last night and you know that that wasn't what they're supposed to do and they know that, what we do, we show them Jesus and how to get back out of that. How to not let the door on the trap slam shut, but to pull them back out, to raise the door back up. We need to be restorers, not saviors. Restorers, not saviors. Because you see, Jesus is the one that puts all the pieces back together. Our job is just to point them in the right direction to get the glue but here's an important part of that. We cannot ignore sin and be quiet about it. We can't. If we see a brother or sister in sin, we need to call their hand to it. But here's what I want to uh, uh, challenge you. Do that with discernment through prayer. How to approach that. Do I condemn or do I make them aware? Discernment. Then, because in that discernment, it gets us right into the next thing, is the restorer, which would be us in this particular case, that's trying to help restore. We've got to do it in a spiritual way. Don't be on a rescue mission. I'm going to save them all. I'm going to fix the problem. I'm going to do all these things. You can't be on a rescue mission. What you have to be on is a mission from God to put them in the sight, cross-eyed, on Jesus. 
You, you can't be on a, a rescue mission. I'm going to fix this. I'm going, because the Jesus is a five-letter word and not a single one of those letters got I, is I. It's all Jesus. It's not us. Matthew chapter 7, verse 5 says, Hypocrite, first take the beam of wood out of your eye, and then you'll see clearly take the splinter out of your brother's eye. Anybody ever used that or ever thought of that or ever had that used on you? You take that, you take that plank out of your eye, then you can work on a splinter. It's in mine, brother. We need to discern that in our life. When we're going to approach somebody else that's in what we recognize to be sin, we need to be repentant, repentive before the Lord. We need to make sure we're not in uh, blasphemy against the Lord. We need to make sure that our sins are forgiven before the Lord before we go and we work on this thing for somebody else. Make sure you're right. Jesus Christ, if he hadn't have been holy, sin, sinless, and pure, the cross would have meant nothing. Everything he did for you and he did for me, if he hadn't have been sinless, if he hadn't have been pure, if he hadn't have been holy, it would have meant nothing. And if we go before people to try to help them to Jesus and we're not pure in the eyes of Jesus Christ, guess what? We're not going to have much luck. What he's basically saying here is, is see your heart first. Before you get into their mess, before you get into their trap, make sure and take a good hard look. Discern where your heart's at. Because Jesus is absolutely against arrogance. He's against self-righteousness. The restorer has got to be gentle. Martin Luther read, uh, wrote this. He says, Run unto him, and reaching out your hand, raise him up again. Confront him with sweet words, and embrace him with motherly arms. You know, and, that, and when I read that, it kind of reminded me of Jesus and Peter, and then Jesus standing on the water, and he says, Peter, just come on out here to me. Just come on out. Peter climbed out of the boat, and he started walking, and what happened? The enticements of Satan started working on him. The trap door was open and the bait in there was attractive to him and he took his eyes off Jesus and he began to sink. But let me tell you something, the most encouraging part of this whole story is when he started to sink, Jesus grabbed his hand and pulled him back. That's what we have to be. We've got to be gentle. Because let me tell you, I, I don't know if anybody's ever worked with an addict of any type whether it's substance or whatever it may be, pornography, whatever it is, the hardest thing to do is to keep them from going back to it. Oh, they want to quit. They'll make the statements. They'll do all those things. But when the rowing gets tough, they go back to it. It takes gentleness to reach your hand back out and to pull them back up again. We've got to have that gentleness. Gentleness is a fruit of the Spirit. The Spirit is the Spirit of God that's in us. That fruit of gentleness is of God. Look at Jesus Christ. He went and died on a cross that he had never sinned, that nothing had ever gone wrong. He was holy. He was pure. And yet he did it because he was gentle enough for me and you. But let me give you another caution. As a restorer, you've got to be careful. Paul says, watching out for yourselves so you also won't be tempted. Watch out so you won't be tempted. Think about that. Now, you remember I told you, Satan took a survey on all of us and he knows what tempts us. So he'll put somebody else through the temptation just to get you in the midst of it as well. If you have a problem with alcohol, don't go to the bar and try to pull your friend out. Protect yourself. If you've got a, a problem with drugs, don't go down to the meth house and try to find your friend and get them out of it. you got a problem with pornography, don't go to the strip bar and try to get your friend out of the midst of that problem. Don't put yourself in harm's way. Find out a way without putting yourself in the midst of it where you can fall into that trap as well. You have to be careful. We've got to be humble. We've got to be humble in bearing the burdens for our brothers and sisters. 
You know, it's easy to say, man, I, don't, I, st- I can't believe that they went. Th- I can't believe that they let themselves get drugged down into that. Let me tell you, I've said that. And you know what? Before long, I find myself heading down those types of same roads, and I have to be called back and pulled out myself. You never know. What road is going to pull you down? Those living in sin need our help. Those living in sin need our help. You look at verses 2 through 5 and what we read, and Paul talks about that all through it. But he says, don't let your brothers get crushed. Be quick to react. Be quick to react. In our flesh, we're concerned with our burdens, but the Spirit produces love for others. We've got to be quick to react. You know, there's so many things in my life. You know, habits don't just happen. Habits are formed. Habits start here. A little bit won't hurt. Nobody will know. Then it becomes this. Then it becomes that. You know, I remember I never smoked until I was uh, starting a carpenter's union. And I was driving back and forth to Louisville to school, and I was working up there, and it would take me, you know, I would leave the house at 4 o'clock in the morning, and I wouldn't get home till midnight every night because I had class. And all that, all that stuff was going on. I was driving by myself back and forth to Louisville every day. So I couldn't stand cigarettes because I would choke and gag every time. So I got me a pack of the hardest cigarettes I could find and I put them on the dash of the truck and every time I start dozing off I'd take a puff, a puff or two of them cigarettes and guess what I would hack and cough and I was wide awake man this was working great until that pack started going in my pocket and then instead of buying one pack every other three or four days I was buying a pack a day then I was buying two packs a day and guess what? God got my attention. 32 years old, he said, you're having a heart attack. And I did. And I quit. But my point is, just that right there, it won't hurt anybody. It won't hurt anything. You know, well, that didn't hurt anything. A little bit more. Habits are formed. We've got to react. That's my old Barney Fife stuff, man. Nipper in the bud. Get to it quick. You know, if we let things fester and fester and fester, they get to a great big head. And I don't know about you all, if you ever popped a big pimple, guess what? The bigger it is, the bigger the mess is, isn't it? It takes a mess. And then you got to clean it up. Nip it in the bud. We have got to get on those things quick. We can't let them fester. Pride sometimes hinders us from doing those things. What's the scripture that we read says? It says, For if anyone considers himself to be something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. He deceives himself. Let me tell you what. The only thing that I am, the only thing that I can be is through Christ who lives in me. So everything that I am is Christ. Good, bad, or ugly, it's Christ. It's nothing of me. So if I think I can step in there and I can save my brother, if I think I can get in there and I can deter my brother, I have deceived myself because it is not within me. It is within Christ who lives in me. We have to give it to Christ. Pride. Because some of us really think we're something, don't we? Hey, I'm the pastor. You just come up here and I'll lay hands on you, put a little oil on you, and you'll be just fine. Let me tell you what, it ain't got nothing to do with me, it ain't got nothing to do with my hands, it ain't got nothing to do with the oil, it's got to do with the power of Jesus Christ. It ain't got anything to do with grandpa was a preacher and, and grandma was a piano player, but it's got to do with Jesus Christ. Pride hinders brotherly love. As they come to get ready to lead us in uh, worship, holiness Holiness is a harvest. I read this, and I want to read it to you. Holiness is a harvest. The seeds are mainly thoughts and deeds. Stott wrote this right here. He says, every time we allow our mind to harbor a grudge, nurse a grievance, entertain an impure fantasy, 
wallow in self-pity. We are sowing to the flesh. Every time we linger in bad company whose insidious influence we know that we cannot resist, every time we lie in bed when we ought to be up and praying, every time we read pornographic literature, every time we take a risk that strains our self-control, we are sowing, sowing, sowing to the flesh. When I read that, this is what jumped out at me. I loved what he read. I wrote, but this is what jumped out at me. It's all got to do, everything he's talking about here, about sowing to the flesh, it's got to do with personal desire. This is when I, in my mind, I harbor a grudge. It's right here. When I nurse a grievance, it's me right here. When I entertain an impure fantasy, it's right here. It's in my mind wallowing self-pity I'm it's me he goes on says when I every time I lie in the bed and I should be up praying that's because of my selfishness every time I read pornographic literature that's my selfishness my personal desires all these things he's talking about is sowing 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 to the flesh not to the spirit of God we have to be a people that is spirit-led. Not a crowded loneliness, but a biblical, biblical community. One for another. Well, that's a strange concept these days. But that's what the Word of God teaches and preaches to us. You know, as we come to a close here this morning, I just wonder, is there something in your life that has got you trapped? Is there something that Satan has found your vice and you're trapped in, that, in the back of that trap and you can't get out, but you need some help? Let me tell you, this morning, do you need to cry out for help? Brothers and sisters, do we need to acknowledge the cries this morning? With our spirit, not our flesh. Maybe you're here this morning and, and you haven't accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. Let me tell you this morning, I'm crying out to you right now, come unto the Father. He says, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes unto me, unto me, unto him except through me. Have you made that way? Have you made that way? If you would stand with us as they lead us in worship this morning, the altar is open. We invite you to come this morning meeting Jesus.
Thank you again for joining us for worship today here at Hartford Baptist Church. We pray that the Lord has touched your heart and soul through His Word today. We would like to take this time to invite young and old to join us for Vacation Bible School this summer. The dates are June 3rd through June 7th, 5.30 to 8 p.m. nightly. We at Hartford Baptist Church would also like to invite you on June 9th to our combined service. That day we are focusing on you. We're calling that day our Invite Your One Day. Would you be my one guest for that day? Go to our website at www.hartfordbaptistchurch.org where you can find icons and media connections where you can pre-register for VBS as well as a place where you can let us know that you will be our guest on June the 9th. We will conclude June the 9th with a meal prepared simply for our guests. Join us at HBC 415 Liberty Street, Hartford, Kentucky, next to the Community Center. God bless and have a great Lord's Day. <music>